Okay, we're back here live inside theCUBE. We are live in Boston, Massachusetts. This is SiliconANGLE and Wikibon's theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. Um, here, this is the HP Vertica End User Conference. The hashtag is HP Big Data 2013. This is uh, HP Vertica's their big data story. This is not a vendor promoting themselves with product and wares. It's really, you know, they're doing it through their customers. This is a customer event. Um, very intimate conversation with their top customers, a lot of heavyweights here doing some really good work, um, getting into the trenches, and we're here to extract that signal from noise and provide commentary and share with you what we've learned, and some stories we can share with you because <laughs> we're under strict, uh, uh, kind of an NDA, not to talk about until they get through their quiet period, and we'll respect that, but uh, when Suzette's done, we'll be going crazy on that, siliconangle.com and wikibon.org. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of wikibon.org. Kurt Monash is here. Kurt and I just came off a panel. Uh, Kurt Monash is a longtime industry analyst, blogger, opinion maker. Uh, check out his blog, uh, dbms2.com, uh, and, and, and other Bring research. Just Google Kurt Monash with a C. We say we Kurt, welcome to theCUBE. It's great to see you. We get the absolute best guests. Yeah, you do need a headset, so uh, <laughs> I'm just going to keep talking while John puts the headset on. So Kurt and I were just on a, on a panel with Vinny Murchandani. And uh, uh, hosted by Chris Sand, we, we were covering big data. You know, the, the big data—the term is—is you know, is it BS or is it real? Uh, we're going to talk with you about privacy issues. We're going to get your opinions on on the evolution of the database business, uh, BI. But um, again, welcome to the queue. Hey, thanks for having me. So you're well known in the uh, the industry, and I like to. Uh to refer to you as, as, as a man who likes to cut through the BS, go right to the meat of the, meat of the story. Uh, you've got a great respectful reputation. Um, you're not afraid to, 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 to say what's on your mind and obviously uh, you're not influenced and that's well known. And you get a great readership certainly in, in the space and, and congratulations on that. So I got to ask you, I got to ask you, uh, on the panel there's some controversy up there. What, what, I mean, what do you think about all these end users here? I mean, I see HP is trying to speak through their customers. So it's not a lot of grandstanding on the HP, pushing the product. They're, let, you know, they're trying to work with their customers. What's your take here? at HP? Um, I'm not totally sure what you're asking. I didn't attend What's the sessions. Uh, what do you think about the topic of big data relative to Vertica and their opportunity, their openness, um, the ability to create this software enablement on top of it, and Haven, the prospects of, say, Haven, for instance? Okay, so I hate the term big data because, you know, you know Monash's, one of Monash's laws of commercial semantics is bad jargon drives out good, and since big data is hot, <laughs> everyone uses the term whatever they could possibly mean by it. You know, I'd like to have different terms for each of the famous V's or maybe a combined volume and velocity and you know, the, the variety and variability be something else. So that said, there are a lot of things that are called big data that have a lot of reality to them. I mean, certainly the size of the databases is large and getting larger, and if we need to scale out today, we will always need to scale out, because on the machine-generated data side, you know, the sensors that generate more data get cheap just as quickly as the systems that could hold more data on a single node. Um, I think the you know, dynamic schema thing is really important. For decades, we've had the so-called TED Cod guarantee in the relational system, which is you can do whatever app you want against the same relational database. And so the apps have been loosely coupled to the database, but the data structures for the different apps have been tightly coupled by the DBA. And that's not always a good system if you want to develop something quickly. The other way around is you have the, for what app you have the data, the app tightly structured, and you pay your due, you pay your technical debt later on. Um, and there are just so many reasons for schemas to change. You do M&A, you're acquiring new things. You get new apps, you're doing new things. You try a new marketing campaign, you're doing new things. You put a few new sensors, or you replace sensors with a new model that generates more data. You're doing new things. You're doing analytics where you do derived data along the way and putting it back at the database, and then you discover what is useful. You're doing new things. So trying to stay in a tight schema can be quite painful. So, so help me understand what you just said about the app being tightly coupled to the database. So take, for example, a Workday. Mm -hmm. right, my understanding is that app is tightly coupled to that their, their, its database. Is, are you, are you, first of all, is that correct? And are you suggesting that there's trade-offs down the road? Workday has a, a, as a structure, as a database architecture, it's really completely different from what 
most people would recommend for an in-house enterprise app. Yeah. I mean, they just take a bunch of Java objects and serialize them to basically a key value store pretty much, although they use MySQL to do that for historical yeah. reasons. Okay. I think. Uh, <clears throat> And then they also have you know, a few things like payroll details that they throw into huge tables in the traditional way. So talk a little bit about privacy. This is something that is a hot button of yours right now. You've mm -hmm. been spending a lot of time thinking about it, and you're not the type of person that just throws out you know, ideas without having thought about them for, for a while. So you've been, you've been you know, ruminating on privacy for a while. What's your current thinking? You want to talk about Prism a little bit as well? Get your thoughts there. <clears throat> I mean, I, I think it's hugely important. And you know, governments have guns, they could kill everybody, we have rules in place that normally dissuade them from killing everybody, but you know, we have to have those rules or we would live in a tyranny. I think surveillance is almost on that level of seriousness. Um, you take a look at what's being tracked, you know, every transaction is tracked by the credit cards, our physical location is tracked by the license plate cameras and our mobile devices and the credit card, our communications are tracked, and you know, that's been the big revel revelation of PRISM of the past couple months is that, you know, I call them the Snowden revelations because PRISM is just one particular program, is that yes, that's real. And you know, the implications are you know, extremely dangerous. You know, obviously, you can have any kind of you know, government doing whatever they want, having the information do whatever they want to the citizen. You can have discrimination by employers and insurers and credit granters and so on. And our rules as a society, whether in the US or in other countries, are not yet adequate for controlling that. And the direction of attempts to control it aren't going that well, because controlling information to flow alone won't get the job done, because you have the anti-terrorism argument, we need everything in the hands of the terrorism fighters. So the government will have all the information, and therefore, we need more rules as to how the information is used. And we need to prevent actual abuses and we need to prevent them so well that we don't have a chilling effect on the exercise of ordinary freedom, that you shouldn't be afraid to go rock climbing for fear that it's going to make you look like a risk taker and not get hired by a conservative organization 10 years down the road. Or only pay cash because you don't want to pay a credit card to admit that you do recreational rock climbing. That would be way too far. And as an industry, we have to show leadership in educating the lawmakers and regulators because there is tough technology here. And it's so early, too. I mean, one of the things that I commented on about that whole privacy thing was obviously it's still early post 9 11. You look at what the whole purpose of all the surveillance was, and it's always been going on. The question is how early in the innovation of, of the of the data analysis and the kind of new algorithms that are put in place, whether it's machine learning or other computer science approaches that are that are relatively new. So you hear about that in the big data space. So, you know, to me, the question is always is, yeah, we need, we don't want we don't want uh, lobbyists controlling the government, which they do now. That's even to me worse than kind of what we're seeing with the privacy debate. The guys who are actually going to be regulating privacy with, let's say, Prism and the effects of the Snowden uh, uh, leaks or whistleblowing or mm -hmm. traitor, traitor that he is, uh, as some people say, all three have been has been called. The question is, how do you balance the innovation that needs to happen here in the U.S., not just for federal, but for commercial? I mean, Dave brought this up on the panel about the chief data officer. Great theory, a new CIO-like title, but is that going to be e-discovery? Is that going to be more you know, restrictions? And I just, I just think it's too early, Dave and Kurt, and I want to get your comments on that. When do you say, okay, something has risen up to the point of maturity to be looked at, that's beyond innovation. Putting in the new laws, the new procedures is a very difficult problem. Um, and it's going to take years, so we better start right away, or continue right away. Um, right now, the best political action for avoiding you know, you know, tyranny through surveillance is just inhibiting the exchange and storage of information. That's a very crude tool. There's downside, I mean, HIPAA from the 1990s has tremendous downside because it interfered with health research and we could interfere with business or other things. So we need to get started as fast as possible and doing it right. But if what, if what you were implying was that the anal analytics are much cruder than they will be at some point in the future, I absolutely agree with you. I mean. You know, these uses of graphs are just people like looking at the two hop or the three hop graphs or whatever and guessing what patterns might be relevant is really 
no sophisticated analytics there. You know, statistics isn't that far past the linear regression, except for a few machine learning things. And I think there's a new generation of startups which are trying to change that in a profound way. You know, the classic use of SAS or SPSS or even R is you know, really not that interesting. It's a few basic algorithms, a lot of variants on it, some very stultified procedures for getting the work done. So yeah, the analysis is going to get a lot more capable and therefore you know, the privacy threat is a lot more deadly. So Dave, what's your take on So it? have you been on this privacy kick for, for a while? Because you mentioned credit card information and, and I really haven't thought about it that deeply, but I feel like you know if, if the government is tracking you know the metadata around who I call, I'm less concerned about that than I am that Equifax is selling my 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 information. So, am I being naive about that, or have you always felt like this has been a problem, or is it because of the massive amounts of data that are now hitting us that One this is going to become? One of the least prescient things I ever wrote was November 2008. Oh, good, Obama is president. He's going to fix this problem that has been emerging. <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't work out very well from the surveillance standpoint. I'm a good Democrat, and in other ways, I'm pleased with what happened in the elections, but the surveillance side has been a disaster as far but as But don't I you think. wonder what he knows now that we don't know, that he's privy to? That is where I completely concede that the government needs all the information it can get for narrow use cases. A, they probably do, and B, even if they don't, we're never going to win that battle. <laughs> so who cares? <laughs> Let us just assume that for narrow use cases, the government has access to everything. And to some extent, they're trade-offs. If they were doing a better job of snooping on our residents, maybe the Sunayev brothers would have been stopped and we wouldn't have had you know, 9,000 know, paramilitary cops running around shutting down Boston. There are trade-offs. Uh. You know, the TSA lines are ridiculous, and if they did a better job of snooping on people, maybe we wouldn't suffer so much at the airport. There are legitimate reasons for the government to defend us against the worst threats. We just have to very narrowly constrain the use of that information. I don't even want it used in murder trials. Certainly, I don't want it given to the DEA. That's already going too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a trade-off. Um, I want to ch ask, change gears a little bit and go into the world of Hadoop. We had um, George Kadifa on and we talked about why HP doesn't have their own distribution of Hadoop. And he was clear, hey, we, want, we support open standards. We do not want to see fragmentation. I then went on my little diatribe how Linux was forced by the Solaris, uh, HP UX, and AIX, and IBM's Unix main uh, software to, to kind of consolidate. But Hadoop didn't have that same threat of some looming monster uh, incumbent. Uh, but now, fragmentation seems to rear uh, its head in some people's minds that fragmentation's the enemy, not unification. So, so will Hadoop unify? Um, obviously, you've been tracking, you wrote a blog post about Hortonworks and, and the change, leadership, and, and some other, other updates. What's your take on, on, the, on the Hadoop ecosystem? I mean, what's your view on how this could track, and what are the upsides, downsides, and, and, and what do you think might happen? Well, I mean, remember that Cloudera still has a huge share of the commercial market, um, you know, Hortonworks is number two, but you know, it's in, that's a largely through the help of you know, Teradata and Microsoft. I mean, Microsoft is a company that way back in the 1970s convinced the world that proprietary software paid for was a good thing, and we shouldn't assume all software was open source. So they have the rah, rah, everything should be open source, companies are being pushed by Microsoft, you know, is a little odd. But, you know, Horton worked to clear doing good work. You know, IBM has this loyal, wears blue underwear customer base that buys whatever IBM puts out, but there's you know, really no good reason for IBM to have its own distro other than that they feel like it, and they can have their own anything. And what's Intel's motivation? Just they don't want to pick a pony, it's too early, or they really want to have their own distro to embed into some sort of edge, intelligent edge, or? I mean, I mean everybody wants, I mean, Intel may just be, you know, be Try, well, okay, so first of all, there are a lot of rumors that Intel was going to buy Hortonworks and so yeah. on, or, for, or offered $700 million and was trying to buy other things. And I found them pretty cred those rumors pretty credible, widespread rumors. Um, so maybe they're just looking to diversify. But secondly, you know, Hadoop is very immature in many ways. So the decision 
to accept the latest and greatest and less mature technology is a bit individualistic. So for example, last in June of last year, Cloudera shipped elements of what is called Hadoop 2. Hortonworks still hasn't because they're waiting for the whole thing to be baked. But those elements that they shipped, a lot of them developed by their own engineers, were good things. Like a major speed up to HDFS, Hadoop distributed file system, and you know, this big name node will fail over that everybody yeah, cares about. Yeah. So they were shipping that then, even though the true essence of Hadoop 2, you know, the new engines, execution engines, still aren't ready for prime time. And you know, that was, I think, the right choice, as I blogged this week, and I think everyone should agree it was a responsible choice, whether or not you think it was right. So I think that's what's driving it. You know, there are certain features that should be in the main trunk, and certain companies get impatient and say, we'll take responsibility for getting ahead of the general Will that, will that cause fragmentation? Stuff. People won't wait to get impatient, kind of shoot the the starting line a little bit and try to force it into their stacks, or is that good thing, bad thing, indifferent? I mean, I don't think it's a big problem. Um, it's a lot of that's you know the fragmentations on you know the management side, in some sense of management or the performance side, rather than you know the actual programming APIs. You know, as of a year ago, the only way to really talk to Hadoop was through MapReduce one, or. 14 months ago, let's say. And that's that. So fragmentation below that doesn't strike me as a huge problem. Now, would I suggest somebody hook up with MapR because they think MapR performs better this year? Probably not. Because you know, you know, Cloudera is a safer bet. And is Map, what are you hearing about MapR? What's the latest in, on the... Um, I'm not hearing much. Yeah, you've written that. You've written that you know, there's not a lot of action going on. There's, so. I mean, I certainly ha have know of more than one company that felt MapR had enough users that they needed to support MapR. Um, but that seems to have come in large part from the early burst when EMC was pushing MapR, which they no longer are. Yeah, and they got pivotal, which, what is that, what is that all about? I mean, Green Plum pivoting again um, seems to be kind of trying to find their home Home, home centroid, if you will, in the in the world. Yeah, they, they've thrown a lot of resources at it. You know, they say a lot of things in the sales process that may or may not be entirely accurate. You know, Parish forbid that salesmen should say that, but I think they've been on a call which was pretty dramatic along those lines. <laughs> but you know, there like is, the number of contributors to their op there do. <laughs> but you know, there, you know, there is a problem which is that EMC would like to sell you expensive storage and I'm not really sure why storage should be expensive. I mean, yeah, OpenStack and Swift and all that or other alternatives, I mean, and I'm not sure there's enough value in there to pay for the expensive In storage. Pivotal or OpenStack? In EMC's core business. Oh, in EMC, yeah, exactly. What's your and, take and, on? And, and, and basically, they're having a religious war, they're saying, we are more, we're, EMC is strategic to you, therefore you should buy our database software and our Hadoop distro, and why should, e I mean, I think you know, Oracle is more strategic to them. I think having the best Hadoop APIs support is more strategic to them. Well, I so, think if anything, EMC is strategic to the, to the I customer. Meant, I meant to the customer. No, I'm saying. I'm be, saying if they get into a strategic war, say pick one, be right. sure to follow Oracle or EMC, they're more locked into Oracle. Well, but it's it, but, but the better example might be Oracle or VMware because it's not EMC's storage container that is strategic to the customer, but VMware probably has a stronger case than than EMC's you know spinning rust. VMware is awesomeness for legacy applications. When yeah, I well, I think every enterprise will have a you know, do most of the computing on a small number of clusters. I think one of them will be a VMware cluster. But that doesn't mean you need to do your Hadoop and your, your analytic database management on VMware. Well, I'm just arguing That's that from, what a, built for. from a, yeah. from, from a, a pivotal operating leverage standpoint, they'd probably get more from the VMware juice than they would the EMC. Nonetheless, you know, the they have a bunch of EMC salesmen That's true, around that's true. Saying that, you know, you know, a, a large fraction of your data counted by byte will be in HDFS, and you should store data in EMC, and that's a synergy. But, 
you know, have yeah, you basically we're, we're just saying it's a weak story and we're phrasing it differently, but we're agreeing that it's I a guess weak so. story. I guess so. I think, uh, although I, I, I like EMC because they've re reinvented themselves many, many times, and I actually think Joe Tucci realizes that you know, the end is near, whatever near is, you know, mid, mid term mm -hmm. to long term. I mean, they got to ride that horse in the sunset. With, but with but the storage is not business. going down. We were at EMC World, Symmetrix was supposed to be dying, uh, <laughs> you know, growing. 10 quarters ago and it's still yeah. growing. You know, so it's like, th there's going to be a need for massive storage. The question is how much and where it sits relative to commodity yeah. hardware and software. And I, how mean, fast I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the acquisition of HDF, of Hadoop and HDFS has been your bit, big bit bucket, which now is called Data Lake and Reservoir and other wet. Yeah, I hate that term, data lake. I hate it. It's <laughs> but, an whatever, ocean. but whatever it's is, freaking yeah. ocean data, you know. And so. the whole point is that it's a cheap way to do it. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of antithetical to EMC. So one thing yeah. we've been hearing here, at, uh, we've been hearing uh, since day one we were here, is that a lot of guys, and we, we met with uh, the guy Looker, a startup that was funded by, uh, funded by an architect, for, used to be at Netscape, and uh, he didn't have to do any more startups. He's, he's, he's about uh, my age, in late 40s, uh, early 50s, and. Um, he says, hey, you know what, I want to do a BI software because I don't want to, I'm, I now can build software without the constraints of the BS that was involved because of the slowness of access to the data. So with Vertica, which built on top of, he doesn't have to deal with that anymore. He's writing specific software and taking out those old software layers. So that, that, that kind of brings a mindset question I want to ask you is that the mindset of these new developers and entrepreneurs, you talk to a lot of startups, you get briefed a lot, you, know, you get a different mindset of these new software developers. What are you seeing and is that, Similar? Do you hear similar stories about guys coding differently, stripping away some of the older models of, of business intelligence, and get Platform just got massive funding, get Looker's going to announce a round of funding. So what are you hearing from software developers, entrepreneurs, folks writing new software, not retrofitting legacy? Is there a mindset shift? Is there certain things they look for in, in vendors and technology? Well, it's no one thing. I mean, they're taking a lot of they're addressing a lot of new needs, they're taking a lot of new opportunities, and if a company claims to be doing, taking every opportunity at once, I am very, very, very skeptical. <laughs> so, <laughs> there are even, you know, there are many ways to reinvent BI that are worthy. There is the do a Tableau or click view style interface, do it on you know, different scales of database, which is basically the platform story, um, do it with somewhat more friendliness to data and messy schemas, um, clear stories in stealth mode, but it's very much the clear stories. No story. one's seen that, clear stories. Have you seen their, their, any of their code or product yet? Oh yeah. You have? Yeah. And in their, I mean, that is, is that real? Yes. I mean, that is focused on you know, data, you know, marketplaces, third parties, stuff like that, and therefore focused on the problems that that orientation causes. But yeah, that's focused, so it's you know, combining data from multiple data sources you don't entirely control that could give you heartburn. Yeah, and you mentioned on stage schema changes. What, what's your take on that? What did you mean by that? You mentioned that comment. So I feel the question was like, there's a huge issue around the multiple dynamic schema changes. What yeah, so that's, that's a lot of that. So should we be yeah, talking they, they to the noise? Hear. No okay. problem. Um, so I mean, yeah, Mongo is hot, and to a lesser extent, but still admirable, so are Cassandra and a Cassandra and HBase. And at this point, that that's less about the pure ability to scale, because you know, the new SQL guys, you know, my yeah, SQL right. have caught up to some extent. Um, and it's just about that you don't have to specify the schema before you write code. Now, why is that a good thing? Part of it is laziness. There are some you know, very good developers who graduate with computer science degree and they know how to write a DBMS and they don't know how to write a SQL query. So some of it is just that, but there also is the fact it was also just general flexibility. Yeah, it handles any data, right? I mean, it's, that's what you mean by the flexibility piece? It's easy to integrate different data types? Or? Yeah. I mean, data types is a technical term, so I wouldn't use okay. that word. What's, tech but, what's but, the but, technically But the sense corrector. of what you were saying, absolutely. Yeah. But it's sort of that the structure in which you want to accommodate data changes quickly. Yeah. So if you're doing a 360-degree customer view, 
and you're pulling in data from a lot of different systems and have a system with you know, quasi record uh, for just that purpose. Is that then you actually, that's your use case for Mongo inside the enterprise that has nothing to do with some sort of a website or anything like that. If you have a product catalog where very disparate products, so you keep adding them, you're a cell phone company and you have service plans, you also have electronic devices, you're selling, you know, sort of accommodating that, the simple yeah. classical relational schema is sort of annoying. I already referred to many other cases where you can buy data from many sources. Um, this is not so much from a Mongo, but a Hadoop dynamic schema use case or adapting to in the relational case is you're doing analysis, you derive some data, you enhance some data, because you know, then next week you do a better piece of analysis and you slightly change the data you want to have stored in your database. So All schemas right. can change very fast. Kurt, thanks for coming inside theCUBE. I know you got to catch a, catch, a, catch a car and we got to get our next guest on. Thanks for coming inside theCUBE. Great uh, Monash research. Go to uh, his blog, uh, search for Kurt Monash, a variety of different um, uh, technology, newsletters, sites, blogs, uh, well followed in the industry. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, sharing your knowledge. This is uh, SiliconANGLE, Keep on theCUBE, here at the HP Vertica End User Conference. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.